This is a discussion on the Wright brothers, the first true aeronautical engineers. Now imagine this, the scene, windswept sand dunes of Kill Devil Hills, four miles south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The time, about 10.35 a.m. on Thursday, December 17th, 1903. The characters, Orville and Wilbur Wright, and five local witnesses, the action. Poised, ready to make history, is a flimsy, odd-looking machine made from spruce and cloth in the form of two wings, one placed above the other. A horizontal elevator is mounted on struts in front of the wings, that's for longitudinal uh, motion, longitudinal control. Behind the wings is a double vertical rudder, and that's for yawing control, directional control. A 12-horsepower engine is mounted on the top surface of the bottom wing, slightly right of center. That's because the pilot was on the other side. To the left of the engine lies a man, Orville Wright, he's the pilot, prone on the bottom wing, facing into the brisk and cold December wind. Behind him rotate two ungainly-looking propellers, driven by two chain and pulley arrangements connected to the same engine. Chain and pulley arrangements just like on a bicycle. The machine begins to move along a 60-foot launching rail on level ground. Wilbur Wright runs along the right side of the machine, supporting the wingtip so it will not drag the sand. Near the end of the starting rail, the machine lifts into the air at this moment, John Daniels of the Kill Devil Life Saving Station takes a photograph that preserves for all time the most historic moment in aviation history. The machine flies unevenly, rising suddenly at about 10 feet, then ducking quickly toward the ground. This type of erratic flight continues for 12 seconds when the machine darts to the sand. 120 feet from the point where it lifted from the starting rail. Thus ends a flight that in Orville's words was, quote, the first in history of the world in which a machine carrying a man had raised itself by its own power into the air in full flight, had sailed forward without reduction of speed, and had finally landed at a point as high as that from which it started." Unquote. This machine was the Wright Flyer I, which is now preserved for posterity in the National Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to interject. A lot of people come into the museum and marvel and ask the question, is that the original Wright Flyer? Is that the real thing? It is the real thing. The flight on that cold December 17th realized the dream of centuries and gave birth to a new way of life. It was the first genuine powered flight of a heavier-than-air, piloted, controlled flying machine. How did they do it? When the Wrights were designing the Wright Flyer, there were no books or design manuals on how to design an airplane. They had to design, they had to develop their own design methodology and do everything by themselves. First, they built gliders and tested these gliders at Kitty Hawk in 1900 and 1901. They used the best available information in the literature to design these gliders. Aerodynamic data for airfoils and wings obtained from the German engineer Otto Lilienthal and structural design principles obtained from the famous civil engineer, Octave Chanute. Based on these data, they calculated everything they needed for the design of the gliders, at least to the extent that they could calculate it. Then they flight tested the gliders at Kitty Hawk. I mean, they built, they designed it, they built it, they flight tested it. Not satisfied with the performance of their gliders, they built a small wind tunnel. In a 1901 and 02, carried out a large number of wind tunnel tests on hundreds of different airfoil and wing shapes. 
the key finding from these tests was that a high aspect ratio wing created higher lift and lower drag than low aspect ratio wings. The wing aspect ratios of their 1900 and 1901 gliders were relatively small, 3.5 and 3.3 respectively. However, after the wind tunnel tests, the Wrights designed a new glider in 1902, 1902 with an aspect ratio of 6.7. Much better and much more aesthetically pleasing, by the way, which allowed that glider to fly beautifully. This use of a high aspect ratio wing was the single most important aerodynamic contribution of their wind tunnel tests to the Wright Flyer. Second, the Wright brothers designed their own engine. Uh, <clears throat> the, this was a design that was uh, based on their own knowledge with the help of uh, mechanic Charlie Taylor in their bicycle shop. And also they designed their own propellers for the powered machine. Very little was known about propeller design. No efficient propellers had really been, been developed, only sort of like paddle wheel things. Third, right from the start of their flying machine work, the Wrights appreciated the need for control about all three axes of the airplane. Longitudinal, which is the pitching direction up and down, yawing motion, which is the directional motion, back and forth, and lateral ro uh, motion with a rolling of the airplane to the right or the left. <coughs> this last, the control of the rolling motion, was uniquely appreciated by the Wrights. They realized that to properly turn an airplane, you don't mush the airplane around by deflecting the rudder as in a boat on water, but rather you roll the airplane tilting the lift vector in the direction of the roll, and this tilted force will turn the airplane in the direction of the roll. To roll the wings of the airplane, the Wrights invented the concept of wing warping, wherein the local angle of attack of one wing, let's say the right wing, would be warped upward by cables attached to the wings, and the local angle of attack of the left wing would be warped downward by the same means. Thus, the lift on the wing warped upward would be increased. At the same time, the lift on the wing warped downward would be decreased. This combination will roll the airplane to the left and hence turn the airplane to the left. This development of lateral control, of control over rolling of the aircraft, is perhaps the most important aspect contributed by the Wrights to make flight possible. Now it's important for us to realize that after about uh, 1912, 1913, wing warping became passe and the rolling was taken, uh, accomplished by the use of ailerons, little flaps out at the end of the wings as Jim Gregory has described in his lectures. But the Wright brothers used wing warping. It was the only way they could figure out to cause the airplane to roll. Finally, the Wright brothers were not merely first in flight. On the path to the first successful airplane, the Wrights, one, conceived the general configuration of their machine. The 1903 machine it was their configuration, their genius. They, later on in 1905, their advancements on the, the, for the third Wright flyer constituted an airplane that could fly through the air for 30 minutes at a time. And the 1905 airplane became the first practical airplane in existence because it could just fly practically forever. They didn't invent the airplane, but they invented the first practical airplane. That was the 1905 flyer. Two, they calculated as much engineering information as they could for the design. Three, they ran their own wind tunnel test to obtain important aerodynamic data. Four, they built gliders and carried out flight tests. And five, they designed their own engine and propellers for the powered machine. They did everything themselves. For this, 
and for further successes over the next five years, building on these achievements, Orville and Wilbur Wright deserve the title as the first true aeronautical engineers in history.